Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we are now getting be able to get started. So again, I'm Anthony Kwan. I'm your host. I'm with the LA County Office of Education and also uh, one of the founding members of the Engaging Girls in STEM organization. Uh, we are so happy to have all of you join us today for an exciting panel of speakers with our Northrop Grumman female ambassadors, STEM specialists. And uh, just to, want to remind you to please um, use the Google form that was sent to you earlier in an email uh, to ask questions. Um, we'll, we'll be able to uh, log all those in and then try to get as many of those questions to our panelists as um, quickly as we can. Before we begin, I do want to also invite all of you to join us next week for our featured speaker, uh, Lynn Dang, also from Northrop Grumman. And we also want to make sure that we thank all of our partners who helped put this together, uh, the California Science Center, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles, NASA JPL, and our newest partner, City of STEM. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Cassie Roby, one of our Engaging Girls in STEM Advisory Council members. Oops, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony, so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to talk very briefly, brief introduction about myself. My name is Cassie Roby. I am the current Miss Los Angeles County. And so I advocate for women in STEM, getting more girls into STEM, involved in STEM, and excited about um, potentially having a career in STEM. I also work at Northrop Grumman, as well as all of these lovely panelists that have volunteered their time today, which I'm very thankful for. And I work doing thermal design engineering for a space program. And then I very briefly did work on the James Webb Space Telescope. I worked some flight operations in Baltimore, Maryland for the thermal team. And so that was short lived because everything is going so great, which is fantastic. And so I'm gonna talk very briefly about what the James Webb Space Telescope is if you don't know already. So this is the new space telescope that recently launched on December 25th of last year. And so it's very new. It's currently in its cool down and calibration phases. So we're making sure that everything is turning on properly before we can fully hand off to NASA to do their scientific investigations and research. It was named after James Edwin Webb, who was the administrator of NASA from 1961 to 1968. And I'm so excited for you guys to learn more about it. I'm sure I'm gonna learn more about it as well. And so if we just wanna go ahead and quickly introduce our panelists, um, we can start with you, Jade. Sure. So everyone can hear me, I assume. Okay. So hi, I'm Jade Mankobulos. I've been working on JWST for seven years. Um, I work on JWST as part of the electrical power subsystem team who is in charge of the units that provide JWST with its power, like the battery and solar array. I'm also part of the electrical design integration team who creates all those wires between all the different subsystems that JWST is made out of. Most recently, I had the awesome opportunity to travel to French Guiana to support launch and also travel to Baltimore, like what Cassie mentioned, to help with commissioning. Um, I'm a first generation Filipino American born and raised in Glendale, so I didn't go really far. I'm still here in LA. I majored in electrical and systems engineering at USC. Outside of work, I like rock climbing, traveling internationally, and eating everything that is matcha flavored. So that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any panel volunteers to go next? I'll go next. Sure, thanks. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Malak Alamad. Um, my background is in electrical engineering. I graduated from Cal State Long Beach in 2018. Um, once I graduated, I started working on web just a couple of weeks later, and I worked as a systems test engineer. Also on the EPS subsystem, I worked very closely with Jade. Um, so I did that for about three years, and I also had the opportunity to go to the launch site in French Guiana, which was an experience that I'll never forget. Um, also, just watching the launch in person was is just ingrained in my brain. I'll never forget it. Um, so that was also an incredible opportunity. I uh, currently work as a technical operations engineer. Once the program launched, um, I no longer worked on it, so it took a bit of a career shift, and I'm working more with, with management instead of um, in a more technical role. 
but uh, web was an amazing highlight of my life and I'll, I'll for, forever be grateful for it. Um, outside of work, I also like to rock climb. I see Jade at the gym all the time. <laughs> um, I also love to swim and play volleyball. I was on my high school volleyball team and uh, just anything that's outdoorsy, active, traveling, um, I love it all. So it's a little bit about me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've never tried rock climbing, but it is a really big thing here in California, especially right here locally. So I'll have to check it out one day. Yeah, actually, um, most of the people at the gym are engineers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Must be an engineering hobby. Then. Yeah. <laughs> great, great. Um, all right, Crystal, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, hi, so my name is uh, Crystal Puga. Um, I have a degree in engineering physics from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and a master's degree in astronautical engineering from USC. And I'm actually going for a second grad program right now in human space flight um, from University of North Dakota. Uh, I've been working on James Webb. I worked James for probably about 10 years um, in various capacities, doing everything from systems engineering, mass properties, um, I also managed all of the release mechanisms that were super critical for the deployments. Those were the 178 single point failures that needed to work in order for James Webb uh, to unfold. Um, and then lastly, my, my last job on James Webb was actually coordinating the entire launch team for vehicle engineering. So I got to go down to the launch site with, with Jade and Malak, and we shared some amazing moments down there um, in the jungles. Uh, so it was an amazing experience. Um, I actually, after James Webb launched, um, I, I've since then moved on, and I, I'm currently working for the, the Human Exploration Organization within Northrop Grumman, doing advanced concepts development, so um, working on the next phase, getting us to the moon and developing lunar moon bases. Wow, that's incredible. I didn't even know Northrop Grumman had that, so good for you. That's incredible. And then last but certainly not least, how about we pass it over to you, Hillary? Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm Hillary Stock. And I'm a deployment specialist, which means I do a lot of different disciplines, but ultimately my job on web is to unfold the telescope, right? So our telescope has to launch in this tight configuration where it's all stowed. And our job on orbit is to, you know, from the gun commands to unfold it and make sure it all occurs flawlessly so that it can do its science. Um, so highlight of my career was probably doing that on orbit for the real thing, but I also was really lucky to be able to be with the hardware kind of from the beginning um, for the sun shield in particular um, and do all of those ground deployments in what we call INT, which is integration and test. Um, so it's kind of come full circle for me. I've been on the program for eight years. Um, and got to see it from unit level tests, with, you know, baby hardware to all the way on orbit deployed and, and now doing science. Um, and I, you know, in my free time, which I don't have a ton of, but in my free time, I do have two young kids. Um, so my husband and I are always doing stuff with them, uh, which is great. Uh, and then, you know, as far as education, I am a USC grad as well, fight on. Um, I got my bachelor's of science Bachelor of Arts and Master's there. Um, two of those are in aerospace engineering and one of them in international relations. Uh, and that's a little summary of me. <laughs> Great, thank you, that's fantastic. I always applaud anybody who is able to have a full career and raise children. I recently got a niece and a goddaughter during COVID and they are a handful already. <laughs> And they're just about to be toddlers. So it, yeah, it's not for the week, but right, it's absolutely. <laughs> um, all right, great. So let's kick it off with our first question. And so I'm interested, I know our audience is interested in knowing how did you get into engineering? So anyone can answer. I'll go ahead and, sure. and take that one. Um, probably because my answers maybe like the worst of everyone's. Um, but I got in, into engineering because my science teacher in high school told me I was good at math and I knew nothing about engineering at the time. Um, and I was like a senior. And they're like, you're really good at math. Why are you TAing for my science class? Maybe you should go do this internship at Northrop Grumman for one credit instead of my one credit TA class. And that was kind of the beginning for me. 
Um, I started a high school involvement program. Um, it's a great program that Northrop Grumman has um, down in San Diego and started in the design department. And I stayed with that internship all through college and then ultimately got my job here full time and then started on web. Um, and I am so thankful because as soon as I got my foot in the door, it opened up this whole world of engineering, which yes, uses math, but also does a lot of other very cool things. Um, so I got to branch out quite a bit. Great, thanks. I have a similar story where I just kind of liked math and science and, you know, went with the flow. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I actually, um, I always joke with my dad that I became an engineer when I turned 12 years old. Um, I did my first science competition at 12 years old doing a, a science competition called Science Olympiad, where I built a Rube Goldberg-like device. And if you know what a Rube Goldberg-like device, it's a series of complicated steps. One action triggers the next action, which triggers the next action, all to do a very simple task, task like popping a balloon. Um, and I did that when I was what, 12 years old was my first competition. Um, and, and I mostly did it because my professor didn't think that I was very good at math in engineering and was like, well, you know, you can try out for the team, but we have a boys team that generally does this competition. Um, and it just, you know, well, lit a fire in me. I was like, no, I'm going to form a girls team and we're going to build a device and it's going to beat the boys team. And I covered it in pink, um, paint and glitter and stickers and uh we actually won we, we beat out the boys team and uh we were able to represent our school uh in this engineering competition and then we won at our local level and then uh, we won first place at our local level and then we ultimately got to go to state competitions and we got third place at state competitions and it was at that moment that I was hooked. I was like, there's nothing else that I want to do ever in life. I just want to be an engineer. I want to uh, design things. And I, I always knew I was interested in space. So it was just a natural progression uh, for me. So uh, sometimes I, I wish I would have maybe looked at other opportunities because I was so dead set from like an early age, like this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Um, I don't look, I, you know, I love it. I love my job, um, but it was definitely something I decided really early on that I wanted to do. I go next. <laughs> Great. Um, so my story is kind of very different from everyone else's already because I never thought that I wanted to be an engineer. And it was actually very late into my, uh, you know, professional development that I actually chose engineering. My entire life, I wanted to be a pediatrician. From when I was like five years old, I always thought that that's what I was going to do. Everything that I did, even throughout like middle school and high school, was more geared towards like life sciences and things like that. Although I was really good at math as well, but um, I was taking, you know, biology, anatomy instead of, you know, physics and other related classes. Um, but it wasn't until we started getting to our college applications when I realized I didn't think that medicine was what was best for me. And I changed my mind very last minute and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So my mom and I sat down and looked at a list of like 500 plus majors and I wrote down all the ones I could possibly do. And we just started scratching off from there. And the last one that I was left with was electrical engineering. And I started with that and I still had a backup plan of switching to bio and going the pre-med route. But once I took a class my sophomore year of college where we did um, digital logic design, I actually got to play with the breadboard and build mini circuits to light up LEDs and you know playing with different um, IC circuits and things like that. And the, the second we started doing that and I actually started understanding what I was doing and seeing my work you know, achieve the desired result, it was very satisfying. And I knew from that moment that I loved it and I was gonna continue with that path. So I dropped my backup plan, stayed in engineering and that's how I'm where I am now. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I could jump in too. I uh, kind of have a similar story with uh, Hillary and actually a little bit Malak too. So honestly, I didn't know what engineering was. I've never been exposed to STEM outreach. I don't think I've ever at that time met an engineer before. All I knew is I enjoyed math and I enjoyed science and I def definitely did not enjoy English class. So I wasn't really quite sure what I wanted to major when it came to college apps. So when I was applying for college, my mom suggested I tried this new major, this new and upcoming major called biomedical engineering. She's like, maybe you could create the next robotic heart. I'm like, cool, let's do that. And so 
not knowing that college definitely takes you to a whole different path than what you thought. It wasn't until I started college that I really understand what engineering was. And thank goodness I was in the right place. It was the material that I was learning that inspired me. It was, you see college students working in labs and outside on the quads that inspired me. It was like the concept of having this seemingly impossible idea and making it happen that helped me stay in engineering. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. All right. Continuing on to our next question. So what were your first thoughts when you started working on the James Webb program? Can I start this one? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, when I started on the program, I was actually in a rotational program. So uh, the thought behind that was I can do three different jobs over three years and then choose which one I want to stay in after those three years. So when I first started on web, it was my dream job. Like I, everything I wanted to do after I graduated was just have any sort of um, uh, significance to the program, just be able to do anything that would contribute to its success. So I applied to like every James Webb position available and I, I finally got one and I interviewed and they said, job's yours, do you want it? And I was like, oh, let me think about it. But then I was really scared because I heard a lot of things about um, you know, what program life is like, but I got over it. I said, yes, and I started working for the program. Um, I still had some of those fears in the back of my mind and starting up from the beginning, there's so much you need to learn. And it was a very, very, very big learning curve. I uh, spent the first like two or three months just hearing information that was going in one year and out the other. It was like learning a whole new language, especially with all the acronyms that you have to learn um, in, in a new program like that. So going into it, I, um, I, I honestly, I wasn't very confident. I didn't know if it was something that I was able to succeed at, but I kept persevering and I was like, I know that once I learn enough, like I'll be able to understand more. So, um, you know, I kept pushing myself. I kept spending extra hours after hours, just you know, learning as much as I can, reading up on researching and things like that. And once I hit maybe like the four or five month mark, I was sitting in meetings and all of a sudden I was like, wait, this all makes sense now. <laughs> so um, there was something that just clicked all of a sudden. So it was very difficult in the beginning, but it was something that I just had to kind of keep pushing myself through. And once I got to a point where uh, it was making sense, I was actually able to, you know, successfully do the work, attend meetings, lead meetings, you know, lead different um, groups of people to, uh, you know, execute tests or run a working group and things like that. So um, it ended up being a, a wonderful experience and I'm glad that I pushed myself, but it was definitely a challenge when I started. Absolutely. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I could jump in. Um, I just, my my first reaction was like, "Wait, did you did you say that I'm going to be on the James Webb Space Telescope, like the the NASA project? What's it doing here at Northrop kind of ordeal?" And so that's when I eventually learned. I was like, "Oh, there are a lot of cool programs like NASA programs that are contracted to other companies to create." So that was really cool. And definitely, I mean, I heard it about this when I was, oh, I don't know, before college. And I mean, who wouldn't want to work on it? The next Hubble telescope, something that can change our history and science books. Yeah, I want to be part of it. But going back to Malak, it's like, even today, I think about how did I get into this program? It's, a, you're, it's full of smart people. And there were people out there who believed in me that got me here today. And so I'm thankful for that. Absolutely, I appreciate you sharing that because imposter syndrome is a big thing that women in STEM face and not feeling like we belong there, not feeling like we are successful and deserve to be there. And so um, I really appreciate you sharing, you know, your story and being personal about that because it is something that we all do face. Um, anybody else want to chime in? I'll chime in. So um, I, when I graduated from college, uh, I went to a, um, a big space conference. Uh, space conferences are the best. You get to meet like-minded people. You get to learn about all the new technology, all the new programs. It's a great way to get recruited and um, meet, uh, you know, you know, future employers. Um, it, it, it was amazing. So I showed up to the space conference and I, I met uh, an engineer who was working on James Webb and she recruited me and she said, yeah, we'll get you into the company. We'll get you to work James Webb. This was about eight months before I had graduated from college. And so 
I, I basically stopped looking. I said, well, there's no reason for me to continue applying to any other companies. I'm going to be working James Webb at Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles. Um, it was it was great. And then when I got when I graduated and finally moved to Los Angeles to work the program, James Webb had got their funding cut, um, which which happens um, a lot of programs. Um, you know, go, go through this sort of thing, government funding gets reduced, it just depends on the yearly budget. And so uh, I didn't get to work on James Webb. And I was heartbroken, because I was like, I, di I didn't apply anywhere else, because I thought I was going to be working James Webb, and then I wasn't. Um, and so I spent three years working on an environmental sensing satellite that monitors the earth, monitors our water levels, cloud levels, which was still a NASA program. So it was still a very exciting program to work. Um, but then that program got canceled. Um, and so I was left with like, okay, I didn't get James Webb. My, my current program got canceled. What am I going to do now? And I had to push. I called everybody that I knew, all my mentors, and I said, you have to get me onto James Webb. That was the only reason I came to this company. And it took me about six weeks of calling everybody, interviewing, interviewing, but I finally made it onto James Webb and then it was like, and then I held on. I was like, I'm gonna stay on here till the, till the very last day till we launch. Uh, Cause it was always my dream uh, to work the program, but it was definitely not without trying. It was, it was three years before I was able to finally get onto the program. Wow, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for, you know, your dedication and your perseverance. I'm glad you were able to, land your dream job. I think that's everybody's dream, right? <laughs> um, anybody else? If not, we can move on. Okay, um, we'll move on to the next question. And so this is kind of like, I guess, a double question. And so the question is, what does slash did your day-to-day -day job look like? And so you can answer this when you worked on the program, if you've now since then moved on, since it's launched, or you can, if you're still working on the program, how did it kind of change throughout the design process and the engineering build? I can start this one off. Um, I kind of had an interesting job uh, because it really did evolve throughout the life of the program. Um, since I worked with deployables, you know, all of the things that move and unfold, uh, when I first started, a lot of that wasn't completely built yet. Uh, so a lot of my job was analysis and sitting behind a computer. And then once we got hardware and it started getting put together, I was down on the high bay floor and working on the high bay floor, you know, hands on with hardware, which is an awesome experience. If you ever get a chance to work, work with hardware, try to do it because it's so much fun and you learn so much. Um, but then after that, you know, once we got truly integrated, we started to have to pivot and think about how this was going to work on orbit. So my job moved more into being in an ops environment, which is, again, sitting behind a computer, but this time you're sitting behind like a telemetry screen and you're on a headset and you're talking to the high bay from a different room while you're monitoring data. And the thread through it was I was always analyzing data and I was always kind of putting together these models that would predict how the hardware would move, but I was always interfacing with different groups. Um, and my job just kind of kept transitioning and evolving. I started working some contingency things. So that's the, you know, oh no, what happens if it doesn't unfold like it's supposed to, right? We have to come up with all of these plans. So I went through a lot of rounds of analysis, a lot of meetings, a lot of big presentations, um, but also always kind of kept my foot in the door with the hardware and being on the high bay floor and really being involved with that. So uh, it, it was one job, you know, for eight years. And it seems like, you know, it seems like a whirlwind to me. Um, but yeah, I, I was lucky to have a job that never got boring, <laughs> that never slowed down for sure. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that. So it is, it did vary day by day, which um, I think kept things really interesting and exciting. One day I'll be sitting at my desk, finishing up some designs or doing some electrical analyses. Other days there could be something that happened during testing that was totally unplanned. And so those days would require getting everyone together, scrambling to understand what happened, 
why it happened, what are we going to do about it, and how can we avoid it in the future. And as hectic as that usually would sound in a day, it's those moments you realize like this is this is engineering, this is teamwork, this is what engineers do to fix a problem. And in the end, we we fix it. And so it makes you wonder like what can't engineers do at the end of the day? Those days are like the most fun. <laughs> They're stressful, but they're fun. <laughs> I'll uh, jump in on that as well. Um, yeah, one of the things that I really loved about working on web was that no day was no two days were the same. I, I loved that every day coming into work, I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't sure what the day was going to look like. It was always constantly varying, which kept it exciting. Um, similar to you know what Jade mentioned, um, you know some days we would be executing on the floor, we would be doing running tests constantly, sometimes for a few hours, sometimes for a month or two weeks. Um, other days I would be, you know, writing procedures or working on code. Um, so there were, there were a lot of different roles that played into what it meant to be a systems test engineer. And, uh, you know, every day was just combining a different combination of pieces of what that meant to uh, make sure that the day was successful, you were able to contribute to the program. You know, some days we were in meetings all day. I remember there were some times my calendar had like 45 meetings in a week. And I was like, when am I going to get some work done? But, but it was normal because there has to be, you know, a constant flow of communication through all the different parties that are involved. Um, but, you know, getting to work on it and doing all those pieces together and, and you know, seeing the, the engineers working and, and actually sitting there doing the work solving problems was, um, was a really great part uh, of actually being a part of that team and working on the program. But every day was different. And that's why I loved it. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in on that and, and echo some of what I heard. I, I think Hillary was right on testing hardware. It is so exhilarating. I think it was probably about five years into my career, maybe even a little longer before I got my hands on real hardware and um, things break. Oh my gosh. And then you have to figure out how to fix it. And why is this wire not working and pull a whole team together and, you know, collaborate with so many different individuals to fix hardware or to understand why a test did not go the way that it did. So those days, um, as stressful as they were, were probably the most fun. Um, but you know, you get the hardware, you get the analysis. Um, it's interesting because my my current job now is so different. It's it's I read a lot, which is you know I read about you know what does NASA want to do, what are their next plans, you know, um, and then thinking a lot. How do we get people on the moon? You know, it's more it's really more of a thought exercise more than hardware, more than like solving a math problem or an engineering problem. There is no like solution equation that you can reference from your college days. It's it's thinking a lot about how do you strategize to live on the moon? No one's ever lived there before. And it's such a different way of thinking of engineering that it doesn't even seem like engineering some days. So um, every day is different. You're gonna be surprised by the amazing opportunities you'll get. Great, thank you guys so much for your answers. And I think something that uh, you guys all kind of said was just how much of a team activity engineering truly is and how important communication and working with others really is when you're trying to make the most advanced, new, innovative product, regardless of what it is. Um, so now I have one more question for you guys, and then we're going to head on over to some of the questions that our uh, attendees have. And so one question, the last question I have that was also kind of on this form was what advice do you have for middle and high school girls who are afraid to go into engineering? I'll kick this off. <laughs> Um, you know, going into any new chapter in life, anything that's unknown, there's always going to be a level of doubt, a little bit of fear uh, that's going to come along with that. And, you know, that's something that I experience, it's something we all experience. It's, it's always part of just not knowing what's going to happen, you know, fearing the unknown. But I think one thing that's really important is understanding that um, it's okay to have those fears, but make sure that you don't let them stop you from pursuing what you want. There are so many things out there, so many opportunities that sometimes, you know, you might, you, you can tend to, you know, psych yourself out or, or overthink things. But a lot of times it's like, if you start it, you do it, you know, you do it well, you'll succeed in it. You'll realize that um, even though those fears were present and they might've been necessary at the time, it's something that you kind of just have to work to overcome. 
Um, one of my favorite quotes that I actually have plastered on my computer so that I always see it all the time, it's by Maya Angelou. It says, um, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor and some style. So I tend to use that as my life motto. There are a lot of things, you know, that, um, you know, maybe being the only woman in engineering or, you know, the only female, the only, I mean, for me particularly, I'm also, you know, the only Muslim I know on my team. I also wear the headscarf. You know, there's a lot of things that, that kind of make, um, that could have been obstacles for me, but sometimes it's, it's one, some of those things that would make you stand out that you can use to your advantage and have those be the reasons why you're standing out. And when you're performing really well and you're doing an amazing job, it's gonna help you in the long run. So, you know, fears are expected, they're normal. I even had a, a mentor tell me that when he first started a new role, he couldn't sleep for three months. So um, it's something that, you know, everyone goes through and um, sometimes it's important to have those feelings as well, but it's also important to understand that, um, you know, if you give it your all, you come in every day and you, you, you be your authentic self and you, you do the best work that you can do, um, everything else will fall into place and the fears will start to subside along the way. I'll jump, I'll jump in on this. Um, since I feel like I, I got started with engineering really early, I, I can advocate that it's never too early to start. If you want to do any form of science or engineering, engineering's all around you. We, I feel like one of the first things I did to understand how things work was I, I tore apart some of my mom's lamps because I wanted to see what the inside of them were. Um, eventually, after me tearing a bunch of things apart, my parents started to take me to thrift shops and to you know, garage sales and buy me things so that I could take them apart and not destroy anything inside the house. So you know, be, be curious, you know, want to understand how do things work? How can I take this apart? How can I do this differently? Um, one of the greatest things now that wasn't available when I was a kid was YouTube. There's so many cool videos about science and engineering and try this experiment, all these really, really cool experiments that I, you could only do at school back in my day. Now you can just like look up, you know, different fun experiments you can do at home and you can get your parents to help you out with them. Um, so it's never too uh, early to start. You don't have to wait until you're in high school or college. You can, you can start tinkering now, right? Start, start, you know, putting some things together, grab yourself a, a screwdriver and start, start exploring the world around you. You don't have to go far to find engineering. Right, and on on that note, um, engineering is so broad. So I, I started out my story saying I first major, I started my major in biomedical engineering. Well, I did eventually change it to electrical engineering thinking it would branch out to even more opportunities. And so you'll find yourself with an engineering mind, right? At some point I actually wanted to design speakers because I enjoyed audio class and then of course, I wanted to be a Disney Imagineer creating rides for Disneyland because engineers could do that. But eventually I did want to go into space because of the great unknown of what space offers. But one of the greatest things that helped me along the way that I would like to give advice on is find people who will ground you, be your support system, help you, push you to succeed. I like to think I wouldn't be here if it weren't for friends I made along the way in high school, college, at work. And so then when you succeed, you pay it forward and give advice to the next generation of those who are thinking about engineering. Yeah, and I would I would really echo what Jade said. I mean, you find somebody that's gonna be there with you for the journey, um, you know, good friends. And when you first start out, it's gonna be coworkers or it's gonna be, you know, college friends and then just jump in just two feet head first whatever you want to do because as soon as you get into the field you're going to find there's so many things you can do uh, even if you look at James Webb you see a lot of amazing engineering you, I mean gold mirrors as far as you can see down our hallways <laughs> um, but also you have to think about every little aspect that comes into that I mean we even have business people that are you know, rocking James Webb gear because they've been there longer than some of the engineers have, right? Like an engineering company has so many facets. So if you can get your foot in the door, you will find something for you. So even if engineering doesn't work out, you know, there's other avenues where you can still have this STEM connection. And there's some parts of it that are, I mean, even if you wanna go pure science, I mean, we have folks on our team that are in astrophysics and 
all these sorts of crazy things, right? And and I'm over here just like tinkering with my mechanical stuff, um, hinges and simple things like that. But before you know it, when you're in an engineering environment, like, you know, I think it was like Malak said, you kind of get that engineering brain and it gets it gets you places, it gets you into doors. So as soon as you commit to, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to jump in, I'm going to do something that scares me. As long as you've got a support system, you know, you can go so far, you can go anywhere with engineering, um, which is why it's, it's truly one of the, the unique fields you can go into. Um, can't, can't say enough good things about it because it's opened up a whole world for me. Yeah, thank you guys. That's all great advice. So we're going to move on into some of the questions that we've received from our audience. And so the first one is how does the Webb Space Telescope send information back to NASA? So I don't know if maybe I'm the best to answer this one. Maybe it's, this might be more of an electrical question for Malak and Jade. Um, but the Webb Telescope has antennas that are able to actually downlink the information. So we get the data kind of not too dissimilarly from how you're seeing us, right? You're, the telescope is getting all this information. It's storing it all on board. And then there's a certain, you know, schedule that they set up to be able to send down this data um, goes through the right the um, I'm spacing on the name in Australia um, the deep space network right and we get all that data back and they funnel it in um, to our stations at the mock the mission operations center in Baltimore and they're able to take that data and process it into images and with web it's actually a little different because Webb sees things in infrared, which is invisible light. Um, so they actually have to reconstruct that data into something that we're, our naked eyes more used to seeing. So some of the pictures are actually going to have some artistic interpretation from what I've heard, um, just because this is, this is light we can't see. Great, thank you for answering that. Um, all right, so the next question I have is, how do you stay so committed? I could jump in. Stay committed as in my work life, daily work? <laughs> I'm going to assume um, so. <laughs> so yes, that's, the, that's all the questions. So committed to, I guess, you know, work-life balance, committed to the mm -hmm. program when it got hard, committed to, you know, maybe in school, your degree when it got hard, just how do you stay committed to your goals? Okay, I could do work. So what motivates me at work is the people I work with. And it does get really hard at some points. There are um, rare opportunities where you get to work more than 12 hours at one point because that's just how, what happens that day. But you have your coworkers around you and they are the most, the smartest people you ever work with. They're empathetic because they're going through it too. And so and that is what gets me through the day is just as long as we're all smiling together, we're doing something great is what motivates me to keep working hard on the web. Um, definitely, it, it, I resonate also in school is it was always having that pack of friends that grounded me when times were hard. They, they took a step back, they helped you out. Maybe this one assignment you just don't get, you just find the right people that could help you, but you will be able to help them back at some point. I'd like to jump in as well, <laughs> if I can. So I definitely agree with everything that Jade said. Um, I think one of the most important things is, is having, you know, the people around you that make everything worthwhile. Um, so one thing that I was very grateful for was our team on web. I loved my coworkers. They were all amazing people. And, and just to echo what Jade said, it was also, there were times where it got really, really um, strenuous, you know, 12, 14 hour days. A lot of times it was very, very exhausting. Sometimes we wouldn't even get weekends off. Um, there were periods where it was, you know, everything web and everything else in your life was put on hold. Um, so having that, that support system around you, people who are also going through the same things as you, 
um, definitely kept me going. The other thing too that I would like to add is, uh, I think for me personally, uh, my passion for the program was kind of what made everything so much easier. Because even through those days where, you know, I, I might start dozing off by hour 10, <laughs> I still would grab another cup of coffee, make sure I was ready to, to, to continue the work because I was passionate about what I was doing. And, you know, I wanted to do the work. It was something that I enjoyed doing. Um, you know, even through its arduous moments, it was extremely rewarding just to be a part of it. So um, the team around me, uh, my passion for it, and and just being, you know, just, just trying to drive the mission of, of the program was what kept me going. And I'll jump in there as well. And I'll direct this more towards um, kind of college level because I, I found that once I got onto web, it was easy to stay motivated. It's so, you know, the mission is just so amazing and you're contributing to something spectacular that's going to change the world. But I felt like where I struggled the most of staying motivated was in college. My very first semester uh, in college was the hardest. I had never gotten low grades before and I had failed my chemistry class. And I thought there's no way that I'm gonna get out of this. I might as well just stop here. You know, how am I gonna get my GPA back up? If I don't get my GPA up, I won't get an internship. If I don't get an internship, I won't get a job. You start to get into your head and like quickly like dissolve into there's no way out of this. Um, so definitely finding the motivation when you're at your lowest is, is something that's so hard. Uh, friends definitely makes a world of difference, but sometimes you feel like your friends may not, you know, understand, like if they didn't fail that class, you're, you know, that you failed, you know, you're like, how can they possibly relate to me? They're doing well, right? They aced that exam. I didn't. Um, so you have to have a lot of self-reflection. You have to be really committed and, and know yourself that, you know, you want this and you have to really want it yourself because at the end of the day, if, 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 if it's not something that motivates you and you're really passionate about it, it doesn't matter all the friends that you have, sometimes getting, getting through engineering's hard. I mean, you know, it, it's not, I think it's, it's something very obvious. I mean, math is hard. Engineering is hard. Um, you'll get through it. I mean, if I can get through it, you can get through it for sure. Um, you know, you just have to be willing to, to put in the time and find your friends. And once you, once you graduate, the world of engineering opens up to you. So you just got to find your commitment. Absolutely. Thank you guys. All right. Moving right along back to a question about the telescope. So how is a James Webb Space Telescope different from or similar to the Hubble Space Telescope or any other space telescopes? I'll take this one. Um, I don't know that much of the technical detail of how they differ, but from some fun facts, uh, the main difference between the James Webb and the Hubble Telescope is that the Hubble was only able to see in our visual light spectrum so just what we can see with our naked eye. And the James Webb is, uh, has the capability of seeing within the infrared light spectrum. So it can see a lot more than the Hubble can. Um, another big difference is that the mirror structure is six times larger. So it can capture a lot more light, get us more, uh, you know, better images. And it's a hundred times more powerful than the Hubble telescope. Um, please correct me if I was wrong. I think I was right. <laughs> Um, if I could jump in and add another one, um, partly because it's a little bit my field. <laughs> um, the James Webb Space Telescope is actually um, very stable. It's able to sit and stare at something for a lot longer than Hubble. Um, so Hubble is in like a low Earth orbit, right? So it's going around the world. So it can only look at things for a short period of time while it's in this orbit. Um, and Webb is at an orbit that's called um, L2 or Lagrange point two. Uh, which is a fancy way of saying it's kind of this stable place with respect to the sun and the earth so that it can look at one star for so much longer and it can you know do these deep space studies just because it's able to capture sort of steady light right you think of a picture you take a camera and you move it and it's all just one blur um james webb doesn't have that because it's very stable um and there's that sun shield there, which is actually, you know, five layers of this very thin material called kepton um, that isolates the heat from the sun and blocks all the light from the sun um, so that the optics are able to stay very, very cold and very, very dark. Um, so it's able to just capture so much more light. 
and, and I'll jump in here to add another factoid. Um, if you actually look at the difference between Hubble and James Webb, they look so different, right? Hubble looks like your traditional telescope. It's kind of, it's in a barrel, all of the mirrors and all of the lenses are inside. So it, what we think of as a traditional telescope is it's inside of a structure. Um, Hubble is very different from that, or James Webb is very different from Hubble in the sense that it's a reflective telescope. All of the mirrors are completely exposed. There isn't a barrel around material surrounding it. So that's, you know, kind of one uh, major difference that it, it, it operates, the, the, the lenses are, are oriented in a different way where it's a reflective type of a telescope. Um, Hubble um, also only had one lens. It had one giant mirror. Uh, James Webb has 18. So you see the, the photos of James Webb, it has 18 hexagons mirrors that all have to align perfectly so that they operate as one, um, which is another amazing difference between the Hubble and the James Webb. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add on a fun fact, too. So we talked about the two different types of orbits, and we talked about how James Webb is in that L2 point. That's a million miles, about roughly, from Earth, whereas you know, we said the Hubble is in a Leo orbit, which is low Earth orbit. And so it was in a position where we were able to send astronauts up to do service and do maintenance. And so that's why what these women worked on was so important that it had to be perfect because we can't send an astronaut a million miles away to go, you know, fix one of those single point failures or fix the wiring really quick. So we had one shot and we had to get it perfect. And that's why I applaud these women for all of their hard work and everything they did for the program. Um, so moving on to maybe one of our last question questions, it is, was it a lot of trial and error and what were some of the errors? Oh, I may take this one. Um, some, some of our mechanical errors were, were fairly public. <laughs> um, it is a lot of trial and error in some ways, but it's very, very educated trial. <laughs> So when you're building something brand new and, and web was like brand new times a thousand, um, everything that we were doing had never been done before. Even, you know, the most minor things, um, we didn't really have a, a heritage to lean on as hard as, you know, a lot of satellite programs, a lot of satellite programs kind of build off of something else. James Webb was like, let's do it all new. Um, and we had some things that were like on paper, this all works. But when you put it together and test it, there's things you can't anticipate. And that's why you test. And, you know, we went through three system level tests, you know, all these unit, hundreds of unit level tests. And it feels like trial and error sometimes because sometimes you're like, ah, oh, how could we have missed that? And it's like, well, hindsight's 2020. There's no way anybody could have caught some of these interactions because they're all brand new, right? You have hundreds of, very, very smart engineers spending all their time on this and you still just, you can't catch everything. And part of the weird thing about being on a public program um, was that some of that ended up in the news. And there were, there were articles about James Webb having, you know, little parts falling, falling off the sun shield or, or little things like that. And it made it sound very dramatic, um, but in real life in engineering, I was so thankful. <laughs> that test failed because if that test failed that means we have a chance to fix it <laughs> before it goes on orbit um so those little trial and error moments those testing moments are huge and they're wonderful like it's hard to train your brain to think that way but failures in engineering when they're in like test level early on are your saving grace because you can learn a hundred times more from failure than you can from something being successful. And that's that's just what we got to do, right? We got to work out all the bugs, fix them, and, and luckily send, in this case, send James Webb up into space with almost no issues. Well, really no issues. <laughs> yeah, I'll hold on to that one as well. I think one of the biggest challenges about um, the James Webb program was that the, the telescope was being sent into space 1 million miles away. It wasn't close enough as the Hubble was where if something was wrong, someone could go up there and fix it. Um, so the biggest challenge is making sure that everything had to be 100% perfect before we launched it. 
So going through all those trials and errors, having all of those errors actually come up were so incredibly, you know, they were, they were very essential to have because if we, if we catch them on the ground, we can catch them then. If something happens while it's in space, it's like, you know, there's not much we can do, it's so far away. Um, so they were very important to have, just like Hillary said, and there was so much learning opportunity within it as well. Um, there were a lot of tests that we would do, you know, multiple times, specifically with even the day of launch sequence. Uh, there were so many different dry runs. There were um, different types of dry runs as well. I think we probably ran three different types, maybe, I don't know, 20 times, just to make sure that we got out each and every single one of those little things that would come up during the tests. And there were some times where we would run a dry run, you know, the sixth, seventh time, and we'd think, oh, this one should be, you know, smooth sailing, and then something else would come up. And we would, we, we would see another error and we were like, oh wait, we didn't think of that. We have to fix it now before we have another error while it's in orbit. So um, they do come up and it's, you know, it's normal in the life of integration and testing, um, but it's, it's how you address those problems and making sure that they're all fixed before you get to the launch that really make all the difference. So, uh, so yeah. And then I'll, I'll add on a little bit to that. Um, one of the, with the challenges of designing spacecraft is that we're designing them here on Earth, and our Earth environment is so different from the space environment. One of the things that we have to learn to design around is the fact that here on Earth we have gravity, and gravity is just such a pesky thing because, you know, in space we're not going to deal with gravity. There's no gravity in space, but you have to figure out a way to simulate a non-gravity environment in on Earth, which is a very difficult thing to do, right? How do you how do you eliminate gravity on Earth? So um, our engineers had to get really innovative on how do you simulate an environment like that. But it's never going to be perfect because we can't eliminate gravity. Um, similar with our thermal environment, our thermal environment in space it's very very cold, and it gets really cold and it gets very hot, right? It it has you know temperature swings, mood swings, and on Earth we can simulate that inside of a chamber. But we can't simulate it. We can't make a chamber big enough to hold the entire James Webb Space Telescope. Webb is massive. Um, it's the size of a tennis court. There isn't a, a, term, a chamber big enough or an oven, right, or a cooler big enough to hold James Webb. So you have to kind of get by with, you know, we'll test this part, we'll test that part. Um, those things make it difficult when you're trying to design for a very different environment than you have um, here on Earth. But we have to rise to the occasion and figure out ways to to make the testing successful. Absolutely, I appreciate your little talk about the you know, mood swings, as you call them, as a thermal engineer. I think I'm gonna start using that with my team. <laughs> um, I love that. But I wanna thank you guys so much for your time, your knowledge, your experience. I know I learned a lot, I know our audience learned a lot, and I just really appreciate you guys being here and you know, what you've done to really advance human discovery. And so with that, I'll pass it back over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, let me just share my screen. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. To, um, and uh, I just want to make sure that you are aware again of um, our featured speaker uh, with Lin Dang next week uh, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And again, we want to thank you for joining us today. If your uh, questions didn't get answered, don't worry. We'll send these questions to our panelists, and then we'll, we'll have those responses all to you. Uh, if you joined us late or, um, uh, jo or had to leave, don't worry. We're recording this, and we'll make this a recording available to all of you. But more importantly, we actually look forward to seeing many of you, hopefully next year, in our live event. We are hoping to come back live. Uh, just imagine our panelists here, along with 400 other middle and high school girls in one giant room and uh, just to feel the, the massive amount of power and prestige and more importantly just to be in the presence of these fabulous STEM ambassadors so thank you uh, to the crew of Northrop Grumman I couldn't we could not have uh, done this without all of you today so thank you again everybody uh, thank you Cassie, Jade, Malak, Hillary and Crystal for joining us today Great, thank you. Good night, everybody.